I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. Standing here in your presence, in a grace so relentless, I am one oh, by perfect love. Wrapped within the arms of heaven, in a peace that lasts forever, seeking deep in mercy seas. I'm wide awake. Drawing closer by grace, and oh, my heart is yours. Oh, fear you put, I breathe you in, I lead into your love. Oh, yeah.
hallelujah in the presence of my enemies and I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief and I'll raise a hallelujah And now is a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praise is roar.
Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will see.
It's your breath in our arms. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise. It's your breath in our arms. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our arms. So we Circumstances who are great, great all at all, great all at all, yeah, yeah, great. circumstances everything would diminish that you will increase you are greater than all that is facing us you are greater than all that we have been through you are greater than all the doubts and all the questions we have you are greater than our pain you are greater than our past you are greater than everything great are you Lord great are you Lord Great are you, Lord. Father, we declare, great are you, Lord. Great, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Lord, we declare, with a thousand great hands lifted, we declare. Great are you, Lord. Sometimes you think that that which you're facing is greater. But I want to introduce to you the God that is greater than the mountain in front of you. The God that is greater than the valley you have been through. He will come true for you. He will come true for you. Hey, just open your mouth and say, Father, I know you are mine. And I know that I am yours. No other name but yours. We stand on your rock. We declare that you are God. Him here with your words. If there are words.
words of love this morning you have. Open your own mouth and worship him with those words. Righteous run into it and they are saved. Oh, 
I don't know what your expectations are, but suspend the protocol and just key in. Because the walls will fall. The walls of depression will crumble. The walls of fear will crumble. So lift up your eyes onto the hills. Lift up your eyes onto the hills. For always come at our help. in the house. Reach out and take it for your sister. All chains are falling. The healer is in the house. The restorer is in the house. The redeemer is in the house. He has redeemed the times. The redeemer is in the house. The restorer is in the house. He is yours forever. song before we sing. Ben, please come. Um, set me on fire. Set me on fire on the inside. Do you know that? Okay. Get a mic so that you can use. You can support me on this one. Now, this is a prayer I want us to pray. Um, God is already in us. But the reality is that sometimes Lagos has a way of making us look so chilled and cold. Lagos has a way of diluting the fire. There's a context of spirituality in Lagos where we sometimes become a bit too sophisticated. We don't want to shout. We don't know that, that there's a shape. There is strength in the shout of a king. <laughs> because somehow, we just want to sort of like look put together. Oh, trust me, spirituality is life. You don't know that in the realm of the spirit, dance is a weapon of warfare. Sometimes to conquer depression is to dance. Sometimes to do those, and then when we begin to say, no, 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 douse it out. Sometimes to even... You know, I told you guys how Bishop said he filled up altar. That he danced people in. He would wake up in the middle of the night. Father, I see you. When David danced, when they were bringing the ark, they didn't understand the spiritual dimension of what that was. But God saw him and God's heart moved. Because when God sees that, that dance was a statement. See, in Christ, in the new covenant, all of these tools are worship. Our voice, our words, the music. But we cannot reduce it to just the music. Sometimes you even have to, the one God is waiting to hear. It's not the one we are giving you. It's the one that is, you're coming from your, from your inside. And trust me, you know, sometimes, wherever you are, your own might be God are tired. Say, start with that one. Say, Lord, I'm tired. And then strength comes. And then strength comes. And strength comes. And strength comes. And before long, you're finding the joy of the Lord is your strength. But if you don't lift up the first words, David said unto himself, Why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. Maybe that's where you are starting this morning. You're feeling pressurized. You're feeling pressed down on every side. But shake it off. This morning as we make this a prayer, I want us to burn for God. I want our hearts, trust me, our hearts to be the place where he's active and alive. Amen. Just lift up those hands and worship him.
from the inside yeah. from the inside come fill my heart come fill my life from the inside from the inside from the inside From the inside of me. Well, my 
thoughts with your love. Overwhelm my mind with your love. Overwhelm my mind with your love. Overwhelm my heart with your love. Overwhelm my heart with your love.
eyes to celebrate the Father's presence, to celebrate our family, God's gift to us, Himself. Himself. Amen. And I just pray that you enter a revelation of who God is so you can open up your eyes to see. Because worship flows from revelation. Once you know, once you see, say, the, I will not let any stone out praise me. That song is in L. something else. You know, never grow up in God. Always remain a child. And that's the best way we enter into the things of the kingdom. And you know, when the ones that Jesus pointed to kids and said, if you want to enter, inherit the kingdom, be like these ones, the little ones. The mystery of it is that God is ever a child, even in his own eyes to the world. That's why he can keep no record of your wrongs. Because somewhere he looks at the world and looks at you with this beauty and innocence. He looks at you, he sees his son. He looks at you, he sees himself. He calls us to be part of that. This morning, we're, we're starting a new series. It's an interesting series, but I can tell you guys, th this is my proposition to you. Whatever your plans are, in the next, um, in the next three months, I know we're getting too close, we'll break at some points, but make adjustments to attend the next classes. Um, in case you don't know, track runs like a boot camp. So there are two things we are called to do, word and worship. Everything else is Jara. So we're starting a new series, um, starting this October, and it's called Mass Hill. Initially, I wanted it to be for the tribe base, so if you're interested in doing community life with the tribe, please plug into that. But this is what I'm learning now. The mystery of the gospel is something God is using to raise both leaders, both kings, both entrepreneurs, that the beauty of the gospel is not just to make you a better person on Sunday. It's not about making you more moral. It's about unleashing God through you into the world. Now, the gospel has gone through a series of evolution. What you understand today as the gospel probably was not even the original word God delivered when Christ came. Let's go back in the book of Acts. There are many things you find in the book of Acts. They were radical. In fact, Jesus auditioned, told them to reach upstairs, upper room until you receive something. And when the Spirit of God descended upon them, the city turned upside down. In less than two decades, the gospel had penetrated the entire culture. In fact, people suspect that when Constantine was doing the whole biblical adjustment and adopting the Bible, Constantine was doing it to preserve his political reign because the gospel and the movement had undermined his power. Even up until his mother became born again. And it was like this thing was spreading like fire. So... Maybe he was truly really changed and decided to do what he did, or maybe he wanted to preserve power, but the points I need us to take away from it, the gospel was such a revolution that everyone around decided to learn. 
and adjust. Now, if we have received this revolution called the gospel, why are our lives so full of mundane and ordinary things? There's a suspicion there that I want you to hold for a second. If the gospel transformed lives, someone like Peter, the last time he saw Peter, he was lying. Peter saw a little girl, I think it was in one translation, the girl said it was a little girl that said, I recognize you hanging around Jesus. Peter said, no, be me. Like, it wasn't me. You didn't see me. Then Holy Spirit descended upon Peter. The same Peter stood boldly and decided to preach to thousands of people. They got saved that day. That's the impact of the life of God within you. Now, by the time you look through, the, there was a period in the Bible called the dark years. And that's co- coincided incidentally with the Catholic years. Because the, the Spirit of God did not, did not intend to dwell in buildings. The Spirit was never meant to dwell in tabernacles. So what the Catholic Church did was institutionalize the move of the Spirit. And the Spirit exited through the back door. I'm not saying people there. Some people there have the Spirit of God. So we can't say, oh, what bad. But the point is that God did not really intend to build another mediator. What Paul was saying was that he had taken out the mediator so you and him can have access. Telling a priest to hear your confession was replicating what God has done. Only the Holy Spirit and Christ can play that role. No one is responsible for taking the burden of your confession. He sorted it out. Go to him. So by the time the, move, the movement created layers and layers of what God had rolled back, the gospel became a bit diluted. Now when you come down to the Reformation, the Reformation was powerful. My board, please. So the Reformation was powerful. I don't know if you guys know about the Reformation Yes. It's, now, interestingly, there was a guy called Martin Luther, not King Jr., the original Martin Luther. The guy was studying the Bible one particular day, and he stumbled on something. You know what he stumbled on? He said, hmm, the just shall live by faith. And he went and started asking. He was actually in the seminary to become a priest, if that's the word. He was in the practice. And he asked all the priests that, come, the just shall live by faith. What I understand is that people are, like, we are saved by grace alone because the Catholic Church had things like penance. And they had things like where you had to atone for your sins. There was even a, there's a particular practice where you literally will cut yourself so you will bleed and feel the pain of your sin. Now, that was almost circumcision return. Now, at the end of the day, the Protestant movement is called Protestant because they were protesting. But this Protestant movement did not happen without blood. It, like, it was such a powerful battle. They were burning people at the stakes. Do you know... If you were a Catholic in the Protestant district, your life was in danger. And if you were a Protestant in the Catholic district, your life was in danger. It broke marriages, broke families. But what did he understand? That God was in the move, seeking to rebirth himself out of the institution. God wanted to break open again and begin to connect himself to the human heart. But I can tell you that the Protestant movement, the reformation of that century, they got some things right, but it wasn't complete. And I'll tell you one thing they didn't get. A lot of them understood grace. You are saved by grace through faith alone. But in most of them, and even many centuries, interpreted the gospel through the lens of separation. So they understood grace, but the fact was that for them, God was something they needed to encounter. God was something they needed to find. So a lot of John Calvin, Martin Luther, and most of those people back in the era, God was in the move introducing grace. But he just so, he didn't, I don't know why God concealed to them to understand union. In fact, some people understood union. People like St. Francis of Assisi or St. Augustine, you hear them say things that, indeed, God is one with man, and God is a man, because they saw it in the Bible, but it was not mainstream. It was not mainstream. In fact, if you were talking too much about that you're experiencing God, you're a suspect. They roast you. You know, they actually roasted not a few. So if you had a prophetic gift, just behave normal. They will move you from the church and say, today you die for claiming to know God, because there was something even in the, in the Reformation movement, there are groups, but there's a particular group which we call cessationists. I know you guys don't understand these things, but trust me, for tribe, you must know it all. The reason is that the war that is coming, or the culture war that is coming, you need, you need to know God for yourself. Because the enemy will come as an angel of, angel of light. The enemy will not come without the Bible. He will come as the Bible. So how would you discern and know to tell the difference between if this one, let me quote the Bible to Jesus. He said, tempt him with every scripture. So you need to know for you to thrive and succeed. But here is the thing. All the, all the, the reformation movements, there was the gap of separation. Separation means that they kind of felt God was apart from them. God was distant from them. So if we plot a timeline, let me show you a timeline. Um, how this one looks quite, this is the plan. Okay, so if we go from the, the Catholic, 
the Catholic years. Ah, okay, well, well, I'll try and write Biblia because my handwriting looks like prescription. You know, these pharmacists, they write it so you don't go to the other pharmacy. You come and ask me what I will I'll give you the medicine. Well, but Catholic Church, then there is the Protestant movement. Well, this, and then after the Protestant movement, the next move of God we saw that was mighty. God's general. I don't know if you guys read the book. God's general was such a powerful book. It was. It happened with. There was a move in, in called Azusa, in a, a street at the time. And for the first time after a long time, people started to hear the Holy Spirit, and people started to see miracles. The reformed, a lot of them battled with the idea of cessation or continuation. What it means is that they, some of them believe that the gifts of the Spirit ceased with the death of the last apostle. Another group believed that the, the gifts continued. Now, in the, before, in the revival, which we call the revival, Azusa movement, the revival, you saw again the death, the descending, like the power of God making manifest. So all of them, even up until Catherine Kuhlman and the rest, we saw powerful move of God. But you know the, you know the, you know the funny thing about these people? Honestly, a lot of these men who God used... This light is doing over time. It's kind of like, it, can we adjust it? It's, it's flooding too much. Edith, if we can fix this, please. Yeah, turn it slightly. Um, too much reflection. So they, they kind of said, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the people in the revival move, in the Azusa movement, let me tell you a few things about them. A lot of them had many more of things. And up until that time, if you are reformed, it was almost inconceivable that God would walk through a flawed man. So because the reformed, you, you were, there was this intellectual defense for the truth. It became an apologetics kind of conversation. So they had a lot of, and it coincided with the Enlightenment age. And the Enlightenment age, there was a move going on in the world that was talking about that the definition of who you are is your thoughts. So Descartes, one of the um, philosophers of the day, had quoted something, I think, therefore I am. And that I think, therefore I am, I think it was the one, guys. I think it was the one, I think, therefore I am. You know, that became a plank in culture. Suddenly, people start to pivot away from religion or God and emphasize thoughts. But the reality was that they didn't understand they were never meant to oppose to each other. For God had told us in Isaiah, come, let us reason one for another. So God did not give us the gift of the mind so we could resist him. He gave us the gift of the mind so he could work with us in an intelligent way. But these people could not reconcile the divide. So the Enlightenment age was a big move. In fact, it started a political revolution. Literally every monarch started to fall, crumble. Right? On the other hand, the Protestant movement and the Enlightenment movement shaped civilization. Till date, a lot of the people, whether it was Sigmund Freud, that you guys are studying, everything, they were borrowing from the, the, the particular era. But a lot of what they started to realize, there was also an infiltration that was coming into the gospel. So a lot of the people started to practice something we call syncretism. And this is what syncretism means. Syncretism means that borrow from it wherever you find it. So a lot of them will study Greek mythology. They will see something, at this nice. And it was as though the Greek mythology, they started to borrow things. In, the, in, the, in Judaism, God was not a monotheistic God. In Judaism, what I mean is that the revelation of God was not God as one man sitting on a throne far away from you. That was a Greek mythology. That revelation of God was rooted in Pluto. It was the philosopher that said, and he defined everything, even soulmates. The idea of soulmates is not a Christian theology. Soulmates is Greek. It was indeed Pluto that said, um, seek ye your own in another. There's a half of you looking around. What, what the, because the Greek had an external orientation to theology or religion. So everything was looking away from you towards another. And they had different gods. They had Apollos. They had Zeus. They had all of them with different set of power. When God came to encounter Israel, God called Abraham out of the halls of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans had multiple gods. So it was called polytheistic. And God said, Abraham, I'm about to take you on a journey. Now, depart ye from your gods of your fathers. God told him that. Part of the pitch was denounce now these foreign, these gods of your fathers. I introduce to you a new covenant that makes me your God. So I and you were one. But the revelation of the, of the Hebrew God was Trinity, not Mono. Because the revelation of the, of the Hebrew God was Trinity, 
there was already love in the midst of them. So love was not something God encountered when he made man. It was from love that man came. For love to be loved, love has to be shared. A monotheistic God cannot love. He's all by himself, existing. But the, the God community of the Trinity, we, is, love is the bond that they, they stay together. They are in an endless, eternal, loving relationship. So you came from love. There was a love void that somehow crafted, God crafted inside of us. There was divinity. There was love. So when he said, let us make man in our image, he was speaking to himself. Let us make man in our image. He was speaking to himself. Love was speaking to love. Love was speaking to himself. Let us make man. And that was the journey. That was your genesis. That was your beginning. So when we say here, you didn't begin when you were born. We're only telling you that you began long before you appeared. So your parents cannot define you completely because they only came as you came. God told Isaiah once, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew thee. The day you become your, the day your date of birth became your definition, that is why we are where we are. But I'm saying that a of journey has happened in the gospel. When the Pentecostal move happened in Nigeria, it was a big move. Suddenly, the church got a revelation of faith. Faith was a powerful move. It is it's still a powerful move. But the faith movement was like, it's name it and claim it type of faith. So they saw faith as something to receive from God. But somehow, because they had a better and they had, but the faith movement were not so theological. They were more experiential. So the faith move was about, oh, God has an inheritance. Take it. And I've told you here, God does have an inheritance. Think about it. He said a good man leaves an inheritance for his children, children in Proverbs. But he was giving us a clue of himself as a father that will indeed give an inheritance. And he called Christ. So he God has an inheritance. But the faith move had dimension of inheritance and wealth. But there was something the faith move didn't always have. The faith move didn't have the context of sonship. So a lot of them were only as powerful as they did not fornicate. So the faith move was, a, was about getting from God. But they didn't understand that while they were waiting to get, God had placed the entire resources of heaven within them. Is this a good idea? All right, so while the faith move was about faith to receive, now there's a new, God has moved though, but God is moving. And I can tell you why you're here is because God is trying to unveil something. There's a new plot of the gospel that God is upgrading our consciousness into. And this plot, I don't know what to call it, but it's not so much Pentecostal. Maybe if I can, for purpose of Christ, I might say maybe Pentecostal. But it's just to help you understand something. That God has never been static. God was in the reformation. God is in the revival. Now God is also in where we are going. God was in the Pentecostal move. Faith for healing. Now what God is taking us to? It's called the age of sonship. And the age of consciousness. And the age of perspective. And the age of divinity. So in this one you realize that you are not separate from God. Three things behind this age. One of them, very key. When God said, let us make man in our image and after likeness. Marco, please give me Genesis 2, 7. Let's plot that. Now, when God said, let us make man in our after, there is one understanding that we've kept. We believe that we're made in the image and likeness of God. And that's where most Christians stop. But that is not the accurate definition of that. You are made in the image and likeness of God. It's true. But when you go, he gave us another example. Paul said, you are the temple of the living God where God dwells. So tell me, is there something else? Am I just made in the image and likeness of God? Or I am also the temple where God dwells. Both are correct. You're made in the image and likeness of God. But you're also the temple where he dwells. Now this third particular perspective will give us something else. A clue. A clue. Why are you called human being? Why are you called human being? Think about it for a second. If you have to introduce yourself, why do you say, I am the great, the king? But why would you call yourself, I am Jubamo or I am I am Neo. I mean, why would we call ourselves, I'm Simon, or I'm Cora, or I'm Iverian? Like, why would you call yourself that? That I am, there's a mystery today we need to unlock. Because some of us have entered I am, but the, the revelation is not opening. Now, why are you called a human being? Now, this is where it comes from. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. We, we come here because tribe is about an identity rooted in who you are in God. 
If you spend one year here, trust me, you can change something in this world. Because here is an introduction to your divinity. Christianity was not about restoring humanity alone. It was about reclaiming our humanity, but revealing our divinity. So when you settle for the fact that you are saved, that is just one day. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed breath of life into man's nostrils. And the man became a living soul. Three things were present here. He breathed the breath of life. What you don't understand, that breath is, a, is not actually air. We keep saying what God breathed was, is something called Ruah. Ruah is the spirit of God. So what is that God did not breathe air. God actually breathed spirit. The spirit of God is no less God. The spirit of God is an expression of God. The spirit of God is God. So whenever you see the spirit of the Lord, God is there. When you see the Son, the Spirit and the Father is in the Son. The, the mystery of the Trinity is not, is not unipolar. It's not one God. It's not one God, one person. Some people, that's where they are, one God, one person. You are nearer to the Islam side. For those that actually, some people believe it's three God, three persons. You have gone Greek. <laughs> that's Greek. So he's one God expressed in three persons. But the spirit of God that he breathed into you is every essence of God, a God. This is what it is. In this particular one, that's where Paul, if you look at Galatians, Galatians 2 verse 20, Paul was speaking of a mystery. You know what Paul said? Paul caught the revelation of this. He said God did not breathe air. God invested himself. So what God breathed into you in creation was a deposit of God. He breathed into you a deposit of God. He breathed into you a deposit of God. God invested God in you. Why did it cost the life of a God for you to be saved? Only like can reclaim kind. Only like can reclaim like. Only kind can save kind. Do you understand? Now, he actually poured something. He poured himself. And if your definition is your body, the dust, you are going to limit the expression of divinity. And if your definition, your definition is a living soul, a living person, that part is consciousness by virtue of you are born. So this is where it is. There are three dimensions now. We always talk about it. There is a spirit. Forgive me. There is the body. There is a soul. Now here in the spirit, the spirit is the breath of God, the life of God. This is what Romans 8.14 said. Please be dropping the scripture because right now in this period you have Google. So you have, as I'm saying it, write it so that you can study because this is giving you the plant. You go home and you, you dive. So Romans 8, 14 was talking about that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that if that spirit is in you, it will quicken your mortal bodies. So it was already telling us that this potential of Christ was locked up in us. So the spirit of God, again, notice, the spirit of God has the properties of God. The spirit of God has the life of God. So when Christ came to redeem us, for fellowship to be possible, you have to share kind. You can't have fellowship, no matter how close, you can't have fellowship with dog now. You can't have fellowship. You can stay around him. But fellowship of equal intelligence, of exchange of life, cannot be possible if you're not of the same kind. God knew he was always going to be a man. Do you know in the Trinity now, the second person of the Trinity is a man. But keep that in mind. It's almost dangerous to say this. God knew he was ever going to form, be a man, and he gave us the best suit. Because one day he was going to appear in it. But when Jesus died, he didn't leave his body on earth. Those archaeologists looking for a grave, Wish them well. They have a lifetime of digging. Let them be digging. My point is that he took with him the glorified body. Seated in the, in the, in the Trinity today is a man. And that's why he said that I'm making intercession for you. When God looks at you, he sees that man. <laughs> that's the man you're called to put on. That is your new essence. So there is a false self and a true self. Outside of the spirit of God in you, everything else is a false self. And let me tell you where this gets a bit more interesting. Today, culture tells us you are a soul. Culture will tell you you are your body. Do you know that? If you're in culture, for people that they are, they are, there are people who believe they are their body. Chisel your abs. Knock it into shape. That thing, give it 10 years. You might need another cos cosmetologist to help put things in perspective. All right? My point is, don't make that the goal of, the, of life. Pursuing all of those things, they, are feel, they, they will always fade. Yeah, they were always fade, you know. When I was growing up in Port Harcourt, there, there was this house, the, the finest house in our street. The man just became a commissioner a year before. And suddenly, his son was my friend. Things changed. In fact, that house, eh, I used to name and claim it. 
because I was in faith movement. I am still. But my, now, the last time I went to visit him, that house is not that glorious. Honestly, I, was, I wasn't going to name and claim anything. My point is, the times and seasons will change that. Now, what is the perspective? This is why I'm saying, you know, in Luke, Luke I think it was in Luke, um, Luke 16, verse 41. Let's look at that. Jesus came on the scene and Jesus cried. Let's look at that. Luke 16. Sorry, it's Luke 19.41. Luke 19.41. And I don't think he has changed this picture. I actually think that God is still pretty much in this place. Luke 19, verse 41. Luke 19.41. Someone can read for us if you have a mic. I think that, that, that stuff might be hanging. Okay. Now. This is the picture I want you to see. Jesus came to Jerusalem. What is Jerusalem? Jerusalem, at the time he, was, he showed up in this part of town, Jerusalem was actually, they used to go there for spiritual activity, spiritual life. So they had come for one of those spiritual practices. It's almost like a Sunday. But then they, were, they had all the Passover events. They, were, they would travel. Remember, that was how um, his father had returned him from Egypt. It was during one of those festive periods. They were always observing the traditions of their fathers. But now, this was one of those times when he came to Jerusalem, he saw the crowd. But as they came closer to Jerusalem and Jesus saw the city ahead, he began to weep. If you look at the TPT translation, he said he wept uncontrollably. Now, let me tell you what uncontrollable cry tears is. I don't think weep is. <laughs> this is so bad. This is so bad. Oh, God. Humanity. Oh, no. This is not what it is. I don't think that's what this picture is. So. What, the, what the TPT translation said, that he wept uncontrollably. Somebody, you know what uncontrollably cry is? You look at Nigerian movies, you find it. Ah! Ah! Right. Anyway, there was a bit of drama. But why the savior of the world, why would he cry? Go to 42. 42 will give us a clue. It says, how I wish today that you of all people will understand the way to peace. But now it is too late and the peace is hidden from your eyes. Now, he was speaking of something like a mystery that is hidden from them. When you look at humanity in traffic, this is what he sees. Of. If you go to Apamo or CMS, and you just see everybody with mask now. Some no mask, just jumping, like chasing. You know, you try to park. Ten people are trying to park you. Park here, park here, park here. Right? Now, that's close to an experience of what you see. But I can tell you today, you, my friend, have been living a lie. You, my friend, have been living less than your redemptive benefits. You, my friend, have been living less than your redemptive intent. Every one of us here, except for maybe a few, have gotten flashes of divinity within them. Now, let me tell you how this whole thing is set up. I want to expose to you today, called the conspiracy of culture. I call it cultural captivity. None of us have escaped this thing I'm going to tell you about. But this is the reason why we are all on the rat race. This is the reason why your depression is high in our generation. So, in sociology, there is something we call agent of, trans, agent of socialization, right? Please, I don't know if anybody is a sociologist here. But please, yeah, agent of socialization. What are the agents? Stop it, please. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah, yeah, family, family, family. Agents of socialization, family. Papa, you're going to pay us, so we have... Family one, two, what? Yes, yes, religion is there. Yeah, media, media is there. What else again? Education. Education is here. What else? Environment, I think everything here forms the environment, really. Now, let me tell you, where this is going. Um, you're born into a family. And if you were born into a family, particularly in this part of the world, it's very likely that they did a bit to damage you. I'm sorry about it. But they didn't do it because they wanted to. They just didn't know any better. 
Growing up in family, in the kind of family I was in, competition was natural. You cannot let another neighbor's kid come first. Be they Chris? So, no, you can get too head. So, there was pressure to perform. And most of our parents would only accept you to the extent to which you made them proud. So, they put upon you the burden of, the burden of performance. So, you don't know how to be loved because you had to earn it. And you've carried that program, problem from your life going on and on. You carry it into relationship. Friends can't just be nice. Why did you give me gift? There's something he's looking for. Because the only time your father bought cake for you was the day you came third. You grew up unceremoniously. If you were a middle-born child, you were even, you were even something else. If you're a first-born child, there's another breaking that comes with being first-born. Why did you let them break the... Who broke the TV? You were in the house. You know, all the, all the anger. You burned food. Why did you let the, you know, the, the younger ones who do the whole, commit all the crimes? So if you're a firstborn, please celebrate our firstborns. <laughs> honestly. Honestly, guys. I, honestly, if you're a firstborn, because even I, I have a firstborn now. And every day I'm like, don't let your younger brother get there. I, I've just recruited him to be assistant dad. You should keep an eye. Right? So, like, and the younger ones are just moving around. <laughs> you understand? But there is a breaking that comes into that. So, most of us, we were in a complete, there was, sim- there was sibling rivalry. Even, you don't just know how to love your, uh, celebrate your sibling because your success is your failure. No, no, you're, you're, because you're, the way your mother would look at it, like, do you know one guy told me he's the last of his siblings? Now, your brother on that side of town. But he's the most successful. His other siblings are in their 50s. So I think they, their father was going to sell land. Or I don't know. Something was happening in the family. The elder ones have arrived town long before he did. It took him a day or two. But their father will not have the meeting till the last one arrives. He actually told me that he actually felt bad for the elder, his eldest brother. That the father said, no, no, no. I will not. Nobody should come into any meeting. Let him arrive. And, you know, because he was the most successful. So the best right had moved. But that's an African family for you. If you were raised up in that kind of separation, your identity is already framed around your accomplishments. So you will live your entire life chasing grade. So any failure in exam is a judgment on identity. Your self-worth goes with your third class. They eroded it long before you because they didn't know how to love you for who you are. They had to love you for what you could do or what you could be. And now we're living this life because in story, you know, I, I run an animation company, so I, we do stories a lot. We're producing movies. There's something in every story called the core wound. And the core wound is that if you're writing a story, every character, you have to establish a core wound in the character. That core wound, it predicts the person's life. If a person is wounded by lack of acceptance, that character will be seeking acceptance in people for the rest of the play. So you, you, you and I... There is a core wound from family. Competition with the other person. And if you're coming from a polygamous home, there's another village people added to it now. Because the stepmother must have done something while you're a Do you know, you know, when I get to the third one, so we are coming from an, an ancestral pattern of brokenness. If you're a girl in some families, you are not meant to talk. If a man... You were removed from responsibility and pampered the way out of your... You were removed from domestics. And they didn't teach you how to be a man. Our definition of masculinity, you know, <laughs> there, was, there was this particular kid in the neighborhood where I grew up with. His father was a military, retired military doctor that went to war and he shot his leg. You understand? So the first one was a little too tender. He would cook. He would plate hair. And the man would just pass. What are you doing? Beating, beating. Now, I don't know what the man was seeing by seeing the man play here. The guy just loved all those things. And the man did not want to accept, you cannot be my son. My first son cannot be doing hair. My first son will not be cooking. Be a man. 